Thank you, Nojin. Uh, thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Michigan. I've visited a couple of times. I think the last time was as long ago as 10 years. So uh, that was about the time I started writing this book, uh, which shows you how long I've been at this project. I hope it doesn't take another 10 years for my next book. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Uh, as Nojin says, uh, this is based on my most recent book, Tyranny of the Week, which is, uh, which is here. As you can see, it's the cover image uh, from the book. And there are some flyers, if I may uh, draw attention to my shameless self-promotion for the uh, book, if you're interested in, in purchasing it. Uh, I think it's a 15% discount on Amazon right now. Uh, I... Uh, I have been working on North Korea for some time, and uh, one of the problems, as we all know, of studying North Korea is the lack of, of reliable sources, especially for historians. What, what can we uncover that is really documentary evidence? My first book, The North Korean Revolution, 1945-1950, was based on mostly work in the captured enemy documents, which are materials taken by the U.S. Army from North Korea during the Korean War, mostly in the early stages of the Korean War, 1950, 1951. The US Army is unique in its careful process of documentary gathering. And someday, a, a really masterful study of Saddam Hussein's Iraq will be written based on the material captured in the Iraq conflict 10 years ago. Going beyond 1953, uh, or 1950 was uh, uh, another challenge uh, and I didn't want to simply look at the official publications from the DPRK from, from North Korea. So I decided to go about it in a kind of indirect way. I remembered that I knew how to read German and I applied for a grant from the German government to work in the East German Foreign Ministry archives, which were now all uh, under the unified German <coughs> government and quite open. I spent a summer in Berlin working through those. I went back to Berlin to work uh, on the uh, Socialist Unity Party archives. Uh, and then uh, along the way, I, I learned enough Russian to do some work in the, in the Russian materials. Uh, and I worked very closely with the North Korean International Documentation Project in the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, which has translated enormous numbers of documents from all sorts of languages of the former Eastern Bloc, uh, Bulgarian, Romanian, Czech, Polish, and so forth, uh, as well as, uh, as the Chinese material, which uh, the Chinese was also a language that I did know. So basically utilizing every language I, that I knew and a few that I didn't, I tried to get at North Korea from the outside, as it were, and although it's not perhaps as good as doing work in the North Korean archives, which may never be open in our lifetime, it does give one a sense, uh, a kind of silhouette emerges from these multiple perspectives of what North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, might have been like in this period of the Cold War uh, from the late 40s to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, it is a view from the outside, as I said, but I think it's a closer view than we've ever had before. Uh, and this book is the first that really tries to put all of this together from multiple perspectives, multiple archives, and multiple languages to gain some understanding of how North Korea operated internally and also how it dealt with the outside world, especially uh, its socialist allies. The image here, as you can see, uh, shows this remarkable fraternal closeness, uh, homo sociality, as they say, uh, embodied. Uh, it, it actually does not reflect exactly social solidarity, as you can see from the text. It's about uniting under the banner of anti-imperialism and independence, and you have the torch behind it of independence. This comes from the cover of a North Korean magazine from 1976, at the peak of North Korea's emphasis on third world solidarity, uh, in, at which, and I'll get to this in a moment, at which time the DPRK was trying to create an identity for itself that was not purely embedded in the socialist bloc, but that presented the DPRK as a kind of leader of the non-aligned movement and of the third world uh, in particular. So you have an Asian, presumably a Korean, uh, an African, 
And this fellow here, who I first thought must be Yugoslavian or something, but uh, appears to be a representation of a, of a Latino man. So Asia, Africa, and Latin America united. Uh, but North Korea also is and always had been uh, a socialist country, a country that defined itself as being based in some way on Marxism-Leninism and part of the grand uh, Marxist-Leninist experiment of the 20th century that began with the creation of the Soviet Union uh, and continues on in some form more than 20 years after the Soviet Union is gone. And that's what I want to talk about today, North Korea as a socialist country historically and what that has meant for North Korea's history and possible future. Here we see the Workers' Party headquarters in Pyongyang, how it looked before 2012. And uh, it, this was built in the grand reconstruction project of North Korea after the Korean War in the late 1950s. Uh, and from that time until 2012, there was a painting of Marx and a painting of Lenin, reflecting the origins of the Korean Workers' Party in Marxist-Leninist thought, something shared with other similar regimes uh, in Europe, Asia, and the Caribbean. And this is how it looks today. No Marx, no <coughs> Lenin. Now, how are we to read that? Is it that North Korea is no longer a Marxist-Leninist state that has gone off in its own path, uh, that is no longer a regime in any way reflecting or admitting to be modeled on, on the, the Soviet project. I don't think that's quite it. I think what this reflects is the, the, the final process in what I called my first book, the indigenization or the domestication, the Koreanization of a foreign Marxism-Leninism brought into North Korea with the Soviet occupation of the late 1940s. Uh, uh, and this gets us also then to the question of what kind <coughs> of a state is North Korea. Uh, there have been various ideas about what North Korea is, and a couple of uh, theories are popular today. One, the most common that you'll see in the media, uh, and also in the work of Andrei Lankov, uh, a Russian-born scholar based in South Korea who has just written a book, The Real North Korea, is that it is a, a remnant of Stalinism, that is a leftover Stalinist state that somehow has survived in a, a kind of pure Stalinist form to this day. But it is a regime that's somehow behind in history. And the implication of that is that eventually history will c catch up with it, that North Korea is an anachronism uh, and that it will uh, so someday, perhaps soon, go the way of other Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe. Another somewhat opposing theory is that all of this Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, communism is a facade, it is a mask, that North Korea, what, what it actually is, is fascist. Uh, it is, in fact, a continuation of Japanese imperial militarism in new guise. Uh, this is most strongly uh, emphasized in the recent work of Brian Myers, a literary scholar whose book, The Cleanest Race, gained a lot of attention a year or two ago, uh, in which he essentially argues that North Korea has nothing to do with the history of communism, Marxism, Leninism. It is, in fact, simply a fascist, uh, racist regime. Now, I don't think these are actually necessarily incompatible. Uh, there's been a lot of work in, uh, among the scholars of Eastern Europe uh, on how, in, in fact, fascism and communism or Nazism and Stalinism had a great deal in common, uh, had a common history. They were both responses to the uh, disruptions of the First World War and beyond that, the uh, traumas of modernity in late 19th, early 20th century Europe. So there's a sense in which these may both be right, uh, that there is a sense in which North Korea is embedded in both uh, the fascist and the communist experiments of the uh, first half of the 20th century. And then there have been various attempts to try to ca typologize, to categorize the North Korean regime uh, by various laws as totalitarian, and this was the first kind of umbrella term used to define fascism and communism as a, as a part of a single genus uh, by Hannah Arendt and, the, and others, uh, Brzezinski and Friedrich in their famous book uh, during the Cold War on totalitarianism. <coughs> Bruce Cummings more recently talked about North Korea as a corporatist state, um, as in a sense sort of separating out from both communism and fascism, or simply a dictatorship, uh, which is 
no doubt true, but it's not a term that really tells us very much. That is a despotism, that, it, that is even a, a less well-defined term, and some have even referred to it as a, a sultanist state, which I find very strange and, and, uh, and, and does not really describe what North Korea is. So sultanism, as I understand it from the political science literature, is a type of despotism that does not have a strong ideology, and that is that it's simply a kind of family regime. And although North Korea certainly is a family regime, it is a, a regime suffused with a certain type of ideology. Uh, one term which I, I talk about, it's in the title of my book, and I begin to explore it uh, toward the end of my book in the epilogue, and I, I, I would like to continue on to look at this because there's, there's now new, new work in political theory about, about uh, this idea of a tyranny and what a tyranny is uh, and how this might be a useful political term for certain types of states. It comes, interesting, from the Greek tyrannos, meaning master or sovereign. And there's an interesting kind of etymological reflection, I think, between the idea of a tyranny and the North Korean so-called uh, leading principle of politics called juche, or subjectivity. Uh, juche song, the subject, the sovereign, the master of one's own destiny. But perhaps, and this is not done often enough, I think, perhaps we should actually listen to what the North Koreans themselves say their state is, and what they have consistently said uh, in the uh, propaganda literature in the theoretical writings uh, uh, from the DPRK is that the DPRK represents the creative application of Marxism-Leninism to local conditions. And I think with that in mind, we get away from this uh, Stalinist, fascist uh, kind of juxtaposition to understanding uh, North Korea as a particular type of Marxist-Leninist regime which went in its own path. Now, Uh, when we get back to what is seen and retrospectively the North Koreans themselves referred to as the, the kind of seminal moment of the articulation of Juche, which is often very inadequately translated as self-reliance, Juche Song could be translated a theory of subjectivity or Juche Sasan, um, but that might be too intellectual for most people's understanding of what North Korea is. Um, and I, I have yet to really see what links there might be between Juche Song as a North Korean ideology and Shutaisei as an interwar and immediate post-war North Korean uh, intellectual concept, philosophical concept, and whether or not there was some movement back and forth between the two, which is certainly possible, but I think has not really been proven. Um, but what Kim Il-sung says in December 1955 in a speech to ideological workers, as, as it's called, it was actually a rather large gathering of party leaders, a few hundred of them, in a speech that subsequently became the touchstone that the North Koreans referred back to it as the time in which Kim Il-sung really first expressed Juche as a central idea of North Korean ideology. And what he says about Juche's connection to the Soviet experiment, the Soviet experience, is this, that we should not mechanically copy the forms and methods of the Soviet Union, but should learn from its experience and struggle and from the truth of Marxism-Leninism. So while learning from the experience of the Soviet Union, we must put stress not on the form, but on the essence of that experience. Um, and what I'd like to explore is what that might mean and what that ha might have meant for North Korea uh, since that time. It wasn't until about 10 years later that Juche became fully articulated in a speech that Kim made in Indonesia in 1965, and self-reliance, self-defense, independence became uh, the expressions of Juche, but Juche continued to be and continues to be, although less emphasis, emphasized now, the sort of overarching political ideology <coughs> that defines North Korea. Now, um, I want to briefly look at this question of, in fact, did communism collapse? And by that I mean the end of the Soviet Union and the communist regimes in Eastern Europe between 18, uh, 1989 and 1991. Uh, and part of the presumption that North Korea itself will follow suit uh, is based on the idea that North Korea is simply a kind of holdover of these old regimes that are historical, that have fallen into the dustbin of history, as Khrushchev said, 
and, and it's only a matter of time before the others do as well. And particularly North Korea, which seems the most uh, similar to the old Eastern European Stalinist regimes. I contributed to a book that just came out this year, by edited by political scientist Martin Dmitrov, of Why Communism Did Not Collapse. He goes back to uh, the famous totalitarian definition by Friedrich and Brzezinski, defining communist regimes as autocratic single-party states, where a mass-based Leninist party enjoys a monopoly of the use of force, controls the flow of information, prescribes opposition parties, and exercises substantial control over the economy. Uh, under that definition, according to Dmitrov, in 1989 there were 15 communist states, nine in Europe, five in Asia, uh, he does not count Cambodia, and I think that's correct. And, and he does not count the uh, self-professed socialist regimes in sub-Saharan Africa, which don't uh, really fit into this definition either, and one in the Caribbean, Cuba. <coughs> Since 1991, there have been five communist states, uh, four in Asia, China, North Korea, Laos, and Vietnam, and Cuba and the Caribbean. So, uh, in a sense, communism did not collapse as a political type. It, it disappeared in its European heartland. The Soviet Union collapsed. And part of the reason we think of this as a kind of global collapse is because one country d divided into 15 independent republics, that is the Soviet Union. But if we, if we really look at the numbers of states that existed before 1991 and after, uh, one third of them are still there. Uh, and all predictions to the contrary, they have continued to exist for the last 20 years, in part because the Chinese, the North Koreans, uh, the Vietnamese, the Cubans, and so forth, have looked very carefully at the reasons of why the Soviet Union and Eastern European communist states collapsed and have been uh, very assiduous in trying to prevent such an eventuality for their own regimes. It's interesting to note, I think, that that makes communism the longest lasting type of authoritarian party to emerge since World War I over the last hundred years. Uh, even counting those that did collapse, they have uh, lasted on average longer than fascism, than any fascist regime in Europe, longer than monarchical despotisms, uh, longer than other types of authoritarian states uh, of left or right. Uh, and in fact, North Korea is now the oldest communist state in the world. Uh, which people often uh, don't appreciate. It is one year older than the People's Republic of China. The Soviet <laughs> Union lasted for 74 years, and North Korea has lasted for 65. So uh, in nine years, North Korea will have lasted longer than the Soviet Union. And when we hear about the fragility uh, of North Korea, uh, we might want to remember uh, that it actually has been around uh, and re has been remarkably resilient in its own way for a long time. But it was from almost the very beginning, and certainly by the early 1960s, understood by the Eastern Europeans to be rather unusual. And the East Germans in particular, who always hewed closely to the Soviet line until the very end, when Gorbachev started to do some things they didn't like, and East Germany became a, a pro-North Korean state. The East Germans in particular were always very uh, concerned and a bit condescending about North Korea's unusual uh, uh, condition. Uh, here's a, 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 a report that I found uh, in these German materials uh, in which it says uh, uh, complains that party propaganda is solely and completely oriented toward the wise teachings of uh, our glorious leader, comrade Kim Il-sung, rather than uh, giving proper uh, respect to Marxism Leninism and to the Soviet Union. And then it goes on, this very interesting sentence to say, dogmatism in the Korean Workers' Party is closely linked to mystical ideas of Confucianism, which extend to certain nationalist tendencies. I'm not quite sure what these mystical ideas of Confucianism might be, and I never thought of Confucianism as having a particular mystical element, but nationalism is certainly uh, very important. And when, to get back to this uh, fascism-communism distinction, perhaps the Eastern European uh, country that most closely resembles North Korea uh, in, in the communist period was Romania, uh, which actually shared a lot in common and uh, under which Ceausescu, the uh, last leader of Romania, actually uh, looked very carefully at North Korea as a model. And the Romanian scholar uh, Vladimir Tismanano has called Roma the Romanian system national Stalinism, 
uh, and found some very interesting convergences between interwar uh, fascism in Romania uh, and, um, and post-war communism. Um, well, uh, this continued throughout. I came across this document as well from a Stasi file, uh, the Minister of Security, in which the Stasi, uh, the infamous internal security apparatus in East Germany, complained that the North <coughs> Koreans are monitored too closely and are, are lacking in, their, in freedom, which is quite astonishing for the Stasi to complain about. Um, it turns out uh, at this period, uh, 1984, that there were uh, about 50 or so North Koreans studying in East Germany, one of whom was Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-il's younger brother, or half-brother by Kim Il-sung's second wife, who was studying electrical engineering uh, in, uh, at Humboldt University. Uh, when I first saw the document, by the way, I was very excited because I thought it was Kim Jong-il, since it, the German spelled it J-O-N-G-I-L. But then I remembered, no, J is pronounced uh, like a Y in Germany, so it was not Kim, in German, so it was not Kim Jong-il, but Kim Jong-il. Anyway, um, so I, I thought, wow, I had no idea that Kim Jong-il was an electrical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sadly, that was not the case. Um, again, they're saying the same things that they had said in the early 60s. Um, they see Kim Il-sung as the greatest party leader of the international workers' movement. The students are therefore careful to make no contact with other foreigners. Related to this political opportunities never leave the Korean students. And this is, uh, of course, the case for North Korea even today. But again, I think this reflects the kind of process of indigenization of Marxist <coughs> Leninism within the North Korean system, that they don't want to be polluted by what they see as an incomplete or uh, impure uh, communism, even among their allies, much less by the uh, capitalism of their enemies. By the 1970s, as I mentioned at the outset, North Korea is uh, making efforts to reach beyond the socialist universe, to carve out an identity for itself, not at all rejecting its Marxist-Leninist heritage or its identity as a social state, but presenting the, uh, itself as a non-aligned member of the international community, and in particular, a leader of the third world, uh, one that had uh, successfully become independent from colonialism and had industrialized in a very impressive way, and for a time, uh, had some success. There was also a considerable amount of trade and investment with capitalist countries, especially Japan, uh, which from the late 50s became North Korea's most important capitalist trading partner by far and was finally surpassed by South Korea in 2001, uh, as well as uh, northern European countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, uh, uh, Austria, and also West Germany and France, which had, a, a, for a time, uh, very ambitious plans for uh, economic activity in North Korea, which came to naught. Non-alignment and solidarity with the post-colonial world was which was embodied in this expression, Jutje diplomacy, was quite active. North Korea uh, reached parity with South Korea in terms of the number of diplomatic relations it had, especially in the third world, and especially in Africa, where there was considerable competition between South Korea and North Korea for relations with newly independent countries. And for the most part, the uh, post-colonial African states <coughs> tended to favor North Korea, uh, which it saw as closer to their own idea of uh, independent uh, socialist uh, development and uh, uh, not being uh, uh, a client of the U.S. as they saw South Korea. Uh, <coughs> Again, we see this as a kind of creative application of Marxism and Leninism. This competition with South Korea on the world stage and in the United Nations was a very important motivating factor for the North as it, in both North and South Korea were not members of the United Nations, but they both gained observing rights in 1973, and North Korea sought to gain as many diplomatic partners as possible to advocate for their cause in the United Nations General Assembly, and was quite successful up until about 1975, when the UN General Assembly passed a pro-North Korean resolution that called for the dismantlement of the UN command and the removal of American troops from South Korea. Unfortunately for the North, the UN General Assembly immediately passed a pro-South Korean resolution which counteracted the pro-North Korean revolution and the re uh, resolution as a result was a stalemate. 
But uh, this was the, 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 the theater at which North-South relations was played out. And initially, the North was much more successful, but eventually they were to be eclipsed by South Korea in the early 1980s. Uh, but in, by the early 1980s, then, uh, there was a reorientation toward the Soviet bloc, and that's what I want to spend a little time looking at today and tracing this uh, experience of, uh, that turned out to be very badly timed, of, uh, once again, emphasizing its solidarity with the Soviet bloc as a socialist country. There were economic failures with the first world. North Korea became the, the first communist <coughs> country to default on its loans. Uh, Japanese banks, uh, <coughs> European banks, uh, and businesses found that North Korea was not a very reliable uh, partner or, or target of investment. And, and there were accusations uh, in the mid-1970s of North Korean diplomats smuggling goods in their diplomatic pouches, uh, including alcohol, tobacco, possibly drugs, from Sweden and other countries. So the initial reach to the first world uh, pretty much fell apart and it would not resume again until the 2000s. And there, were, there was disillusionment with the third world. Although diplomatically it was useful to have partners in the third world, economically it turned out to be not uh, a very wise thing for North Korea to do. Uh, these countries w didn't really have the capacity to buy a lot of goods from the DPRK and, and they were not very helpful for North Korea's own economic development goals. At one point, uh, Kim said to uh, the East German leader, Eric Honecker, we are no longer members of the non-aligned movement, which was in technical fact not true, they were. But what he meant by that is that they had come to realize that having these connections to the third world was more, no substitute for economic integration with the socialist bloc, and uh, that's what they wanted to move toward. There's also the very important issue of strategic divergence with China, which had uh, normalized relations with the United States and which sought to align with the U.S. against the Soviet Union, which was, of course, North Korea's main ally against South Korea. So there was, uh, although not a break with China, uh, a certain distancing strategically from China at this time. And there was what some have called the Second Cold War under President Ronald Reagan of the United States, in which the conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union became much more intensified, and particularly over the Korean Peninsula, uh, and uh, under those circumstances, North Korea decided to shift more decisively into a, a pro-Soviet direction, whereas for the previous 25 years, had walked a very careful balance between uh, its relations with China and with the USSR. So with that came the reaffirmation of economic and military ties with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Navy, for example, for the first time since the Korean War, gained rights to dock in North Korean harbors. Uh, the Soviet Union sold advanced uh, weapons and uh, fighter <coughs> jets to the DPRK. And there was much more talk than had been seen in uh, many years uh, of uh, Soviet DPRK solidarity. And under this... Uh, condition, we can understand uh, this very telling event, which was a six-week tour, Kim's last tour of the Soviet Union Eastern Europe, which uh, became um, written up, came to be publicized in a book called Everlasting Fraternal Friendship. So Kim's Everlasting Fraternal Friendship Tour uh, is what I would like to spend a little time focusing on now, um, beginning here, across this vast space of the Soviet Union to Eastern Europe, and then back. Uh, going through China uh, on the way, and bypassing China on the return trip. Uh, this reorientation for the Soviet bloc did not only take a military shape, by the way, it was also economic. Uh, the trade with the Soviet Union doubled in the late 70s and uh, went up by another 50% in the early 1980s. Uh, and by the late 1980s, North Korea was more dependent on trade and aid, uh, trade with and aid from the Soviet Union than at any time since the 1950s. Uh, and this is one reason that the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s was such a disaster for the DPRK. Uh, 
On May 16, 1984, Kim boarded a train uh, in the port city of Chongjin for his state visits to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. It was his most high-profile visit since 1956. At that time, there was a conspiracy of uh, party elites that tried to replace Kim with a collective leadership uh, and uh, led to rather severe purges of the party elite after Kim's return going through the summer of 1958. Uh, the situation now is completely, completely different, and Kim could leave the running of the country to his son, Kim Jong-il, who had been more or less uh, in charge of day-to-day -day political affairs in the DPRK since 1980. Uh, Kim passed into Russia, stopped in the city of Krasnoyarsk, uh, where he visited a hydraulic power station, and was greeted by representatives of the local Communist Party and the Soviet uh, People's Deputies. On May 23rd, Kim and his entourage arrived in Moscow uh, and was given a grand treatment by the new general secretary, Konstantin Chernenko, here on his right, who had taken over from Yuri Andropov after his death in February. Uh, having been just 15 years in office, Chernenko, as you can see, who already looks like he's embalmed, uh, was not <laughs> in the best of health himself uh, and would die after only 13 months in office. Uh, and you can see Kim, a spry 72, looking a very embodiment of vigor and health. Uh, Kim spoke to Chernenko for uh, uh, over an hour, stressed the growth of South Korean militarism, rising American aggression in East Asia, a common threat to the Soviet Union uh, and North Korea, uh, of the struggle against imperialism. And in the end, Chernenko gave him everything Kim asked for. It had been his most successful visit to Moscow since he had gone with the first DPRK cabinet in 1948. From the Soviet Union, Kim went on to meet General Jaruzelski in Poland, who had recently declared martial law in that country. Eric Honecker uh, of East Germany, whom Kim called uh, my brother and best friend. Uh, there was an extraordinary ro romance between Honecker and Kim uh, for a long time. Uh, Kim, in the East German, I haven't seen the North Korean reports, but the East German reports talk about Kim being very excited about Honecker's visit and asking them, uh, when is my brother and best friend going to come next, and so on. Uh, one of my interview subjects was this woman, uh, Helga Pilt, uh, Honecker's Korean interpreter, uh, who uh, was with them in all of their meetings. A very interesting scholar of Korean history in her own right uh, and uh, a source of, of fascinating insights into the East German North Korean relationship. I, uh, in addition to my work in the archives in Berlin, I interviewed a number of, of former diplomats and scholars who specialized in North Korea and I gathered at, at, at one point a group of them uh, in Vienna and just had them talk for two days and it was really quite amazing to hear their stories. Uh, and in part because they had no one to talk to. Uh, they were all pretty much forced to retire ap after the collapse of communist regimes, and no one seemed to care about their opinions on North Korea. I think they're a vastly underutilized resource of understanding uh, DPRK. From there, uh, Kim went on to Czechoslovakia, where he met uh, Gustav Husak, the uh, Czechoslovak uh, leader, and then Janos Kor Kornai in Hungary. Dragoslav Markovic of Yugoslavia, uh, who had taken over from Kim's old friend Josip Broz Tito, who was also close to Kim and who had kind of shared with Kim um, the leadership of the non-aligned movement, or rather Kim imagined that he was a leader of the non-aligned movement. It was really uh, Tito who was much more prominent in that organization, uh, which he had co-founded with uh, 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 Nehru of India. But uh, Yugoslavia was an independent socialist state, uh, not fully integrated into the Soviet bloc, which is something that uh, Kim also wanted for North Korea. Khodor Zhivkov of Bulgaria was the next leader he met. And finally, uh, Romania, where he met his sometime protege, Nicolae Ceausescu. As I said, uh, Romania and North Korea uh, had a somewhat parallel trajectory in their uh, initial, going from their initial founding as very pro-Soviet Stalinist states to a more independent, much more nationalistic type of communism. Uh, and Ceausescu himself 
like a number of other leaders, Hali uh, 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 Mengistu of Ethiopia, for example, uh, uh, Pol Pot was another, saw Kim as a model for emulation. Um, these are not perhaps the best examples of people you want to be your followers, but um, Rom uh, Romania's Ceausescu certainly did seem to see a lot in North Korea in, in Kim's own leadership style and in the idea of Juche, which he thought would be good for his own country, including dynastic succession. And at the end of his life, he was trying to pass on power to his wife. Unfortunately, they were both uh, executed by Romanian security forces in the upheavals of December of 1989, something that must have been very disconcerting to Kim. Uh, Kim and his entourage then crossed back in the Soviet Union, traveled north through Kiev back to Moscow, and then took the Trans-Siberian train uh, across Russia through Khabarovsk, uh, this time without passing China, and disembarked at Chongjin. Looking back at this everlasting fraternal friendship tour from the vantage point of the 21st century, it, it seems like a journey through an ancient civilization on the brink of collapse. None of the leaders Kim met would be in power six years later. Two would be dead. All of the ruling parties would soon fall, and three of the countries that he passed through, the Soviet Union, the German Democratic Republic, and Yugoslavia, would cease to exist by the beginning of the 1990s. North Korea, therefore, chose this unpropitious moment to turn decisively to the socialist countries of Eastern Europe for economic and military assistance and political support. It turned out to be a case of consummate bad timing. Kim could not see, it seems, that behind the facade of parades, folk dances, and showcase industrial projects that greeted him on every, at every stop, the socialist allies were the ailing leaders overseeing crumbling economies and disillusioned polities. Kim himself uh, was in good health, and the North Korean people were probably not yet cynical, certainly uh, nowhere near uh, that of many of the, of the uh, people under <coughs> communist rule in Central and Eastern Europe. But the economy of North Korea, we now know, was, if, it was, if anything, even more moribund than that of Eastern Europe. While nearly all the socialist countries Kim passed through were embarking on uh, new kinds of market-oriented reform by 1984, North Korea was still relying on old Stakhanovite methods, uh, including a new slogan, the speed of the 80s, Pachinunde Sokdo, which sounded and looked very much like the speed of the 1950s. Uh, on the other side, it made little sense for the Soviet Union and its Eastern Europe allies to continue giving economic assistance to North Korea when they were facing so many challenges at home. The Soviet Union in particular could ill afford to be so generous uh, when their economy was beginning to seriously slow down and all of uh, their third world investments, uh, uh, Cuba, India, uh, North Korea, Ethiopia, or uh, Vietnam, and Mongolia were such a serious drain. And uh, under Chernenko's successor, Gorbachev, these debts would be called by Moscow, including that of North Korea. Uh, Kim then went to China later on another visit, but his low-key visit to China was completely overshadowed by this ostentatious tour through the Soviet bloc. Kim had turned to the Soviet bloc for help just as the Soviet economy was entering a fatal downward spiral, we now know, that had begun in 1979 uh, uh, as its GDP was falling significantly year on year, uh, while military expenditures and support for Soviet socialist allies were, starting, were continuing to grow. Five years after Kim's friendship tour, North Korea found itself virtually alone and friendless on the eastern fringes of this once great empire. The disillusion came quickly. In 1985, Gorbachev assumed office, and at the beginning, for the first year or so of his rule, it seemed like he would be as friendly to them as any leader that they had ever seen, perhaps going back to Stalin, certainly much more so than Khrushchev and Brezhnev. Uh, but what the North Korean leaders did not know, uh, and were quite shocked to find out, is that there was already, at this time, an internal review within the Politburo of their relations with North Korea, and they were about to change radically their relationship with East Asia and the Korean Peninsula in particular. In 1988, Hungary was the first socialist country to recognize Seoul, uh, which North Korea decried as the betrayal of, of socialism, but it was only the beginning. In May 1989, Gorbachev and Deng Xiaoping met in Beijing 
in the midst of the Tiananmen protests. And this removed a lot of the leverage that North Korea had uh, utilized so effectively for the previous 30 years in playing off uh, China and the Soviet Union against each other to get maximum concessions from both. And it also removed the inhibition of both Moscow and Beijing in moving toward recognition of the Republic of Korea. 1989 was, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall, followed within a year by the reunification of Germany. And in September of 1990, Moscow recognized uh, Seoul, which was the penultimate blow for the DPRK in its position in the socialist bloc. Of course, the, the Soviet Union itself would soon disappear. Uh, and by the time Beijing recognized Seoul in 1992, it was almost an anticlimax. And in fact, the DPRK media said very little about normalization between South Korea and China. Uh, the big shock was the uh, normalization between the Soviet Union and China, by the, uh, the Soviet Union and, and South Korea, and by the time China followed suit, uh, the North Koreans were more or less resigned. And something that Pyongyang had adamantly opposed for decades finally took place. North and South Korea were admitted to the United States, not uh, to the United Nations, as separate states. And this is the point at which many in the West were quite certain that North Korea would imminently collapse. And if we hear today that North Korea is on the verge of collapse, it might be worth keeping in mind that we've been hearing this story for more than 20 years, that North Korea is still around. What have been these strategies of survival in the post-Cold War world? One is something that I call ideological introversion. Uh, or uh, in North Korean terms, Urishik Sahejui, our style socialism. But <coughs> North Korean socialism has nothing to do with these failed socialism of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. It is something, again, as I would put it, indigenized in North Korea, made Korean uh, that can last as long as Korea lasts. They, uh, the North Korean propaganda apparatus begins to talk about Minjok Song or nationality. Uh, they had talked about Eguk Jui patriotism, but they had not really talked much about ethno nationalism. Uh, this becomes uh, very much part of the language of North Korea in the 1990s in a way that had never been before. In terms of politics, there was a move toward military first uh, policy, Songun uh, Jongchi, in which the military as an institution became uh, the leader of society as it had never been before, but also a great emphasis on the defense of the DPRK against any threats. Of course, North Korea had always been a highly militarized society but the explicit placing of the military as uh, the leading uh, institution and the leading sector of society, even above the working class, was something quite remarkably new. And a tightening of social and information control, uh, despite the extraordinary economic implosion and famine that would occur from 1995 to 1998. That economic disaster led to some ambivalent reform uh, once the worst of the famine was over at the end of the 1990s and with the encouragement of the, uh, and in some cases support of the Kim Dae-jung government in South Korea, uh, North Korea from 2002 to 2005 engaged in a number of agricultural and financial, uh, financial reforms, attempt to establish free economic zones, um, but that was uh, pulled back after 2005. And since Kim Jong-un has come to power in 2011, there seems to be a move once again toward a reformist approach to the economy. Uh, we uh, will have to see how far that goes. Uh, but very importantly, the international environment has kept the DPRK a going concern. Uh, above all, as we all know, the support of China, which, uh, although having distanced itself from North Korea in the immediate post-Cold War years, decided to shift toward a, uh, a strategic emphasis on keeping North Korea viable uh, through uh, substituting for the Soviet Union uh, oil resources for the DPRK above all, but also food supplies and so forth. Nuclear deterrence has been very significant and very uh, much emphasized in recent years, uh, especially for the DPRK as a way of maintaining the regime. Uh, and most recently, there's been an attempt to diversify its international partners to once again look to Europe, to, uh, to look to other parts of Asia and to not be so dependent on China, and on and off again to look to the United States uh, toward uh, improving of relations. 
So although it's dangerous for uh, historians to talk about the future, uh, I will say a few words about where I think this might be going. Uh, one might say following Janos Kornai, the great Hungarian economist, and his typology of, of communist regimes going from revolution to consolidation to mature communism, that under Kim Jong-un, finally, the, Nor the North Korean revolution is over and the regime is consolidated enough to go in a more diversified direction toward reform uh, and some degree of opening, what Kornak calls mature communism. And there's some evidence that since 2011, uh, North Korea is moving in that direction, although that remains to be seen. There have been some signs of agricultural reform uh, under Kim Jong-un, of giving uh, farmers more of their profits. Establishment of uh, up to 11 urban special economic zones, uh, which will have incentives for foreign firms to invest there. Uh, some degree of information opening, which might grow considerably more, uh, I, I have a sense, uh, from my visits and from what I've heard uh, in the next little while. Uh, internet is still highly restricted in the DPRK, but it's beginning to crack uh, and soon uh, crack wide open. Where we are now in looking at North Korea, there uh, is a growing body of thought in Seoul and Washington that North Korea is a failed, or at least a failing state, that finally the predictions of collapse are going to come true. And when North Korea does begin to take the steps toward opening up, this will be the end of the regime. Uh, there's a, a, a report that came out from the Rand Corporation a few weeks ago that says that we must pre be prepared for the possibility of collapse. And that's certainly true. We should be prepared for that eventuality. But I think we should equally, if not more, be prepared for the possibility of non-collapse. Uh, the, the future will not be the same as the past, but based on the uh, survivability, if not the resilience of the North Korean regime, I, I would not bet too much on near-term collapse. And therefore, we have to deal with North Korea as it is uh, for the immediate future. I conclude my book uh, with this quote from the University of Chicago philosopher Leo Strauss, uh, someone I never thought I would be quoting, uh, as someone who uh, had been presented during the Bush administration by the critics of the Bush administration as the kind of godfather of neoconservatives, uh, the neoconservatives in Washington, the teacher Paul Wolfowitz and others, uh, who, it was said, advocated regime change and the elimination of all tyrannies around the world. In fact, what Leo Strauss actually said was a little more nuanced than simply getting rid of the tyrannies we don't like. In many cases, that is the preferred option Strauss argued. But this condition, I think, is perhaps most appropriate to understanding the DPRK or how, how to deal with the DPRK going forward. Under certain conditions, the abolition of tyranny may be out of the question. The best one could hope for is that the tyranny be improved, that the tyrannical rule be exercised as little inhumanely or as irrationally as possible. It's not much of a call to arms, but I think it's a much more realistic uh, way to deal with North Korea than the advocates of imminent collapse would have us believe. Thank you.